Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah. Amma ba'du fa inna khayral kalam kalamullah wa khayral huda huda Rasulullah Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sharrul umur muhdathatuha wa kull muhdathatin bid'atun wa kull wa kull bid'atin dalalatun wa kull dalalatin fin nar. قال الإمام الترمذي رحمة الله عليه باب ما جاء في عمامة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Chapter number 17 is a chapter of what has come to us concerning the imama of رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم and the imama is called the imama according to the ulama of the language because the imama to ta'ummu ras and it goes all around and it covers the head so the actual name of the name of the piece of cloth that is worn took its name from the meaning of the word amma ya'ummu to generalize and totally cover something. It's something that the Nabi used to wear, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and it has his details connected to it. He used to wear a, an imama, and sometimes he had under it a kufi. Sometimes he would wear the imama, and he didn't have any kufi under it. And sometimes he would wear a kufi, and only a kufi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. The ulama of al-Islam have a big ikhtilaf as to whether the imama is from his sunnah of worship, at ta'abud, meaning like the miswak is from the sunnah of ibadah. Is the imama like that? Or is the imama like some of the other clothes that we spoke about that he used to wear Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam A clothing, a type of cloth and clothing that he wear, wore Because it was the clothes, clothes of his environment, of his people So some of the scholars said it was this That is from Ibadah And some said that no It was not from Al-Ibadah And Imam Al-Dhahibi In the tremendous book that he wrote Seer Alam Al-Nubala Where he talks about the biographies of the great ulama of al-Islam and personalities of al-Islam, many times when he tells about the stories and the histories of the different ulama of al-Hadith, the fuqaha and so forth and so on, he would mention that he had or he wore an imama. Like al-Imam Abu Hanifa used to wear an imama. Al-Bukhari Muslim they used to wear the imama. Al-Imam al-Hasan al-Basri used to wear black imama, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhim. Al-Muhim, it's no doubt that the imam is from what the Prophet used to do, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and is from his sunnah, meaning the sunnah according to the muhaddithin. And the muhaddithun said that the sunnah is everything that he did, everything that he said, it was his physical creation and things that were peculiar to him. All of that is the sunnah. So he definitely wore an imama. So it's from the sunnah from that angle. As for the fuqaha of al-Islam, they say that the sunnah is the opposite of al-fard. The sunnah is the opposite of what is wajib, or fard. And from that angle, obviously the imama is not the sunnah. Meaning, if you wear it, you're sinning. It's the opposite of, or if you wear it, there is uh, it's a little bit less than the fard. It's not like that. Certainly the issue of the imama, the imama has a lot of details connected to it, a lot, a lot of details. But what we know about the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that like the previous chapter that we dealt with, the chapter of the mikhfar, that he went into Mecca when he conquered Mecca and he had a black imama on, a black imama. But he didn't, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, always use a black imam. That wasn't his sunnah, like al-imam Ibn al-Qayyim said. In his book Zad al-Ma'ad, 
It's not known that the Prophet Sallallahu used to always wear black imam. As a matter of fact, the narrations that come to us that are true said that his imama, when he entered Mecca, was black. His imama, when he gave a khutbah and spoke to the people in Mecca, that was the one that was black. As for the Juma that he used to wear the imama all the time, no. For the Eid, no. We have to be careful with this issue of being rough and tough on people, the community, on ourselves, because wearing the imama is what the Prophet's people used to do, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's what they used to do. And what we should do is wear the clothes of the people where we come from as long as it doesn't go against the religion of Al-Islam. And not to wear clothes that make you different or make you stand out. You wear the clothes that when people see you in those clothes, they know that you're not wearing those clothes for shuhra, so that you can be a special one and you can stand out. And they say, that guy over there who wears this, who wears that. No. Wear the clothes of the Muslims in the locale, the country where you come from. So if you come from the Gulf states, for an example, they wear the gutra, they wear the shamar. So in that type of environment, it may not be in your best interest to wear an imama or to wear the clothes that the shayukh of Somalia wear. For an example, the longi that people wear. It may not be a good thing to wear because you'll make people look at you in a funny way and you'll make people possibly hate something that's from Al-Islam due to their ignorance. So we shouldn't be rough and tough with people in this particular issue. Let it be known that in relationship to the hadith that talk about the virtues of wearing the imama, all of them are weak. I didn't say that the Prophet didn't wear the imama, but there are some hadith that encourage us to wear the imama. All of them are weak. All of them are weak. So that's a general qa'idah or principle as it relates to the imama. Salatun bi imamatin khair min khamsin wa ishreen salatin bila imama. To wear the imama while you're praying is 25 times better than the imama, the salat that you don't wear in imama. It is a very, very weak hadith. All of them are very weak. All of them. Jum'atun bi imamatin. خير من سبعين جمعة بلا إمامة. Wearing an imama for the Juma prayer is better than seventy Jumas without the imama. There are a few hadith that come like that. Wear the the imama because the malaika they wear the imama. No, all of these hadith are very weak or they're even mawdu. Um, they have been fabricated. And as we mentioned a number of times. If a hadith has multiple chains of narration and they're all weak, they can strengthen each other provided that the weakness is not very serious. There's not a person who is a kadhab, there's not a person in the chain of narration who has been accused of making up and fabricating a hadith. The hadith said, I'tammu tazdadu hilma where the imama and you'll become more soft and more gentle and you'll be, have more hilm, you'll be halim. All of those are not authentic. The ama'im, al-ama'im, tijan al-arab. The amama, the imama, it is the crown of the Arab. So take this general rule. All of the hadith that encourage the wearing of the imama, all of them are weak. And that's why many of the ulama of Islam said, this is not from the sunnah, meaning the sunnah of ibadah, that you should do it because the Prophet encouraged you to do it. He told you to do it. But no doubt, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded in the Quran, informed us in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ You have in the Prophet a perfect example, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So as a result of that, as a result of that, if the person's need is to wear the imama, the imama for that reason, then there is no issue and no ishqal. Al-Imam al-Tirmidhi began hadith number 114, and it is the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullahi radwan Allahi alayhi, Jabir and his father, were both companions, and Jabir ibn Abdullah, one of the six people that narrated the majority of the hadith, qal, 
دخل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مكة يوم الفتح وعليه إمامة سوداء. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم entered into Mecca and he had a black imama on his head when he conquered Mecca. So for the fetah of Mecca, when he conquered Mecca, he came into Mecca and he had an imam on his head. In a previous chapter, the chapter of his mighfar, one hadith said he went into Mecca and he had that head protection, the iron metal head protector on his head. So this hadith right here has been collected by Al-Imam Muslim along with Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi. This hadith right here, it's authentic. And that hadith over there, Bukhari and Muslim. So one is saying he came in with an imama, the other one said he came in with the mighfar. We told you, no big problem, no ishkal. There's no mushkil in that particular issue. He could have come in with the iron thing on his head when the war settled down and there was no danger. He could have taken that off. He put the imam on his head. It's not a big issue. Both of those issues are authentic according to the sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. After that, hadith number 115, al-imam al-tirmidhi said that after giving his chain of narration, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, he gave the khutbah on the member and he had a black imama. He had a black imama. This khutbah that he gave was the khutbah in Mecca when he conquered Mecca. Because, as we mentioned, he wore a black imama one time. And that was when he conquered Mecca, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he conquered Mecca, he had a black imama on and no one else from the companions wore black imama. After him, some of the ulama of al-Islam, they wore black imamas. Like I told you, al-Hasan al-Basri used to wear black imama. But al-Imam al-Hasan al-Basri is not the legislator for us. Who knows, why did he have a black imama? The ulama of al-Islam used to make inkar on people for wearing a black imama because wearing the black imama intentionally can be a sign of showing off. Like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the, la the leader of Daesh. When he came and claimed himself the Khalifa, if you remember that clip, he got up on the mimbar in which he was talking kalam farikh, salah kalam, kalam that has no wazin, has no weight to it at all. He's not known who is he, and he doesn't have the right to get up on a mimbar to declare that he's the Khalifa of the whole Muslim world. Anyway, he had a black imama on. And the black imama that he wore was with intention. And that is, they're in jihad. And he's wearing the black imama. And all of that is just kalam fari. The ithna sharia, the 12 imamas of al-Iraq, al-Iran, the way that they wear the black imamas for the leaders, the ulama from amongst them, the black imama should be avoided. It should be avoided. I don't say that it's haram, I don't say it's haram, but he wore it when he was performing jihad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and the people of innovation wear it now. The people of innovation wear it now, so as to be away from them, it should be something that is avoided. Al-Imam al-Tirmidhi, rahimahullah ta'ala, in this particular hadith, that he gave the khutbah on the member that's also been collected by al-Imam Muslim. He gave the khutbah with a black imama. So this wasn't a second time, it's the same issue that the first hadith is referring to. Hadith number 116, and that is the hadith that is similar to the one that went before it. Al-Imam al-Tirmidhi brings another chain of narration to establish the same issue. And that is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he wore a black imama that was, he wore the imama that was black, and he wore it on the minbar when he gave the people a khutbah. He gave a khutbah, and he wore the black imama. Same hadith as the one previous to it, but being a muhaddith, to leave no doubt as to the authenticity of the first hadith, he's bringing this hadith with a different chain of narration to establish to the student of knowledge. This hadith, there's no doubt about it, because if you look at these two chain of narrations, they support each other and they're saying basically the same thing. So it's not repetition without any benefits. Repetition, and the repetition in it is the benefit in ilm al-hadith, and we just wanted to mention that. Hadith number 117, Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi, he said that his Shaykh Harun ibn Ishaq al-Hamdani told him, 
that Yahya ibn Muhammad al-Madani told him on the authority of Abdul Aziz ibn Muhammad who said that Ubaidullah ibn Umar he said that Nafi' said that ibn Umar may Allah be pleased with ibn Umar and his father he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to wear an imama and he used to allow it to go down and to hang down between his shoulders so there's a new hadith bring a new information and added issue about the imama of the sunnah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had an imama that used to be tied on his head and then there was a part that was hanging down and used to be down his back. And that was what was well known. But concerning his wearing of the imama, sometimes it wouldn't have that and sometimes it would have it. This hadith establishes that he had it. Sometimes he had one, sometimes he had two, sometimes he didn't have any. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, when they chose Zayd ibn Thabid radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr and Umar chose him to be the one who would be the chief, the leader of the lejna, the committee that would bring the Quran together. And he was very young, much younger than Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he made inkar on that decision. He was saying, why would they and how could they choose Zayd ibn Thabit to be the one who's going to head this committee? When I was with the Prophet wasallam as an adult, and there's no ayat of the Quran that was revealed upon him, except that I know when it was revealed and where it was revealed, and Zayd ibn Thabit, he was just a little kid running around in Al-Medina with two of those things flapping behind his head. Which is a proof and an indication that the youngsters of the companions, radiallahu anhum, they used to have this thing, they used to wear the imama, and also they used to wear the imama with that part of the material coming down. So it was wrapped around the head, and one piece would be sticking out, or two pieces would be sticking out, and it would, be go, it would go between the two shoulders from the back. So that is a new aspect concerning the issue of the imama of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nafi', one of the narrators in this hadith, he said that Abdullah ibn Umar, when he wore his imama, he used to also wear that thing behind his neck. He said, and also Ubaidullah, the narrator of this hadith, he said, I saw Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad and I saw Salim also wearing their imamas like that. So in the chain of narration is Al-Imam Nafi'. And in the chain of narration is Ubaidullah ibn Umar. Both of these people in this chain of narration who said in the hadith of Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi that Rasulullah had an imama and it went behind his back. Ubaidullah ibn Umar and Nafi'. The Mullah of Ibn Umar, both of them said, I saw Al Qasim ibn Muhammad and he had this. I, I saw that. And Al Qasim ibn Muhammad is the son of Abu Bakr al Siddiq from the companions of the Prophet. And he said, I saw Salim doing it as well. And Salim is one of the sons of Umar as well. One of the sons of Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Hadith number 118, Ikhwani, Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi, he brought the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbasin. He said that the Prophet sallallahu gave the khubbah and he had a isabatun, so a dasma, isabatun dasma. He didn't call it an imama. He called it an isaba. So since he didn't use the word imama, he used another word, he used isaba, it's not the same word. And Imam at Tirmidhi brought this hadith to show that this word can be used to mean the Imam as well. It's just saying the same thing. Nothing new, just a new word. And that goes to show the precision of the ulama of al-hadith and the ulama of al-islam generally, but the ulama of al-hadith specifically. So there's nothing really new in terms of the way of explaining an explanation. Again, as we mentioned, this issue of the imama, it has its fiqh to it. Is it from the sunnah or not from the sunnah? 
there is ikhtilaf between the scholars of Al-Islam. But the Prophet definitely did it, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And if someone wanted to wear the imam and trying to be like him, he will get rewarded. As we told you before, some of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, used to eat particular food that the Prophet liked. And they only ate it because he liked it, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. And they felt and they knew, if I eat this food because the Prophet liked it, then I'm going to get rewarded based upon my niyat, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. Number two, don't be mutshaddit in these types of issues. Don't be mutshaddit on the other people by saying to the members of this community, you must wear an imama, or you must wear a thawb, or you must wear a kufi, or you must wear the khufs, or you must wear this, or you must open up your button, or you must, you must, you must. The issue of what you wear is a why issue. You can wear whatever you want to wear, whatever color you want to wear, and as long as what you wear doesn't go against this religion, as long as the color doesn't go against the religion, he wore yellow, he wore black, he wore white, he sallallahu alayhi wasallam wore green. All of those things happen during the course of his life, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. As for the imama of the people of Sufia and why they wear the green imama, then much of that, much of that is due to weak hadith. Much of that is due to weak hadith. And to be perfectly honest with you, I personally don't have a big problem with these young people we see walking around in the streets of Birmingham. When they go into their classes, they're coming from their classes, from these browies and things like that. I don't have a big problem with that. The problem that I have is making dua to other than Allah. The problem that we have is the problem of the shirk and the bid'ah and the kufr that has been put inside of the aqidah. As for wearing green imamas, go ahead, we're all green. We're wearing green imamas. Nothing wrong with that. Provided you don't say the Prophet ordered you to do that and this is a religious thing that you should be doing. That's not really the real big problem. Someone wears a green imama and we see him for the first time, I don't think it's fair just to judge him and say he's Sufi until you start hearing what comes out of his mouth and you start to see how that individual is behaving. So take it easy on all of these issues because they were issues that the ulama of Islam, even the ones who said that this is the issue of the sunnah, they were not rough and tough with people because they know in it is ikhtilaf concerning the uh, issue itself. So it's not something that uh, should uh, we make a lot of noise about. The next chapter, Khwani chapter number 18, and I do think, as I mentioned, Al-Imam al-Tirmidhi didn't bring everything about the sunnah of the imama. He said, Bab ma ja'a fi imamati Rasulillah. The chapter of what has come concerning the imama of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he didn't mention the tahniq, the imama that was wrapped around the head and then under the neck. He didn't bring that rahmatullahi alayhi. So we don't claim that any individual other than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has brought all of the sunnah. We don't claim that there is a book that gives you everything that you need to know about this issue or that issue. Someone is going to forget something, no matter how precise the book is. So we shouldn't have gulu in any book, and we shouldn't have gulu in any sheikh. If sheikh so-and-so talks about someone, then this is enough and that's it. You just have to listen to that. That's not our religion. That's not the balanced way of al-Islam. No book has brought everything that the Muslim needs where he can put every other book on the side and just roll and rock with that particular book. That's something that uh, we didn't hear those kind of statements from people of the past. We hear it now, but with the people of the past, this was not the case. Great scholars like Imam Malik and other than that would never ever allow people to only take his book of the Muwatta and rely on his book of the Muwatta to get a knowledge, to get knowledge of the Sunnah because he knew there are many aspects of the sunnah that passed him by. There's no companion that was with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and may Allah be pleased with all of them. There was no companion who, no companion. He had all of the hadith, no companion, because no one was with him every day like that. And even those who spent the bulk of their time with him, Abu Bakr and Umar, may Allah be pleased with both of them. Even those two, some of the sunnah passed them by. Passed them by. And there were other people who came who were less in knowledge, less in virtue, less in degree. They would come to Abu Bakr, they would come to Umar and say, 
this is what I know about this particular issue. And then those ulama who were bigger than the ones who were informing them and educating them, they would bring themselves down and they would take the hadith of the Nabi. So, iyaka wa iyaya. We have to be wary. All of us, be wary. Be careful of the people who teach us, the people who we're around. Be wary of being that. Be careful of being that person. Your sheikh, your madhab, your masjid, they are doing everything right. This masjid doesn't do everything correctly. This masjid doesn't have all of the haq only in this masjid. This is not the reality of the situation. Accept what Allah or his messenger said. For an example, the Quran has everything that we need. The authentic sunnah has everything that we need. Al-Islam has everything that we need. A salafiya a salafiya not a group, a salafiya The Quran and the sunnah and understanding them the way the companions and the salaf of this ummah and the set has everything that they need. So we have Dalil to prove everything is inculcated in these particular things. Other than that, don't make that claim. And when you hear people making those claims, they know that what they're saying is not true and it is bothered. So we're not going to do the next chapter of the Izar. I mean, it's not really a long chapter, the chapter of the Izar. But uh, there are some... Uh, important issues that we want to bring to your attention concerning that particular chapter. So, if you brothers have any questions concerning the imama of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, you can put your questions forward. Alindakum shaykh. Abdul Hay. Concerning the wiping when you're making wudu, with the imama, ikhwani, and that's a very good question because as I mentioned to you, the imam is in the books of fiqh and it's in the books of al-ahadith. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to wear the imama and sometimes we're making the wudu, sometimes we're making the wudu, he would wipe on his imama. When he came to the part of wiping on his head, he would take the water and he would wipe on his imama. Sometimes he would take the water and lift the imama up, and he will wipe on his forehead, and that was it. The imama, when it comes to al-mesh, or wiping on the imama, is not like the khufs, al-mughira, ibn shu'bah. May Allah be pleased with him. What was collected by imam al-Bukhari, a Muslim, he said, I brought the water for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I started pouring the water while he was making wudu. And then when he came to his feet, he had khufs on and Mughira said, I went to take the khufs off. And he said, Da'huma fa'inni adkhaltuhuma tahiratain. Leave them on my foot. Because I put them on when I had wudu. So he allowed the person to make mess on his khufs for one day and one night. Not 24 hours. One day and one night if he is a resident. And he can wipe on his khufs for three days and three nights if he is traveling and he is a musafir. But the imam is not like that. The imama for every single prayer, if the person put the imama on with wudu or without wudu, there was no condition that said you have to put the imama on with wudu. There's no condition. He said about the khufs, you have to make wudu without those khufs and then you put the khufs on. And after putting those khufs on with wudu, you have one day and one night to keep them on while you're living here in Birmingham. You can keep wiping on them for one night and one day. And if you're traveling, three nights and three days. So if you made wudu for Salatul Fajr, you went to sleep, and then you woke up, and you lost your wudu, and you tied the imama on your head without any wudu, when it came time and when it comes time for al wudu you can wipe on the imam. And that's from the ease of al-Islam, the taysir of al-Islam. Yuridullahu an yukhaffifa ankum wa khuliq al-insanu da'ifa. Allah wants to make things easy for you. He doesn't want to make things difficult for you. Mankind was created weak. So this is the ease of al-Islam. Allah didn't tell the woman she has to take her khimar off the khimar of the woman has the same ruling of the imam as the man. If she puts it on, even without wudu, she can wipe on it 
when it's time to make the wudu. Good question, Akhi Abdul Hay. Any more questions, Ikhwani, about the Imam of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam? Any more questions? Fadl ya Akhi. Now, the scholars didn't say that the Prophet ﷺ wore the black imama just because it was jihad. But it happened, just so happened, that he had that particular imama on when he performed the jihad. When he performed the jihad. So in the dikkah and the precision, the person is going to wear the black imama, then that's when it should be done. Some of the ulama said that these are two separate incidents. That him performing the khutbah on the mimbar was a different time because when he traveled, there's no khutbah to Juma. There's no khutbah to Juma. The Juma responsibility and the obligation of the Juma has been raised off of the musafir. If the person travels and he's out in the earth and Friday comes and he's in London, He's in some country, somewhere else. He doesn't have to go to Juma. He doesn't, it's not wajib upon him. Juma has been taken, taken off of the one who is sick, the one who is um, traveling, the, uh, the woman, and the slave. There's no Juma for those individuals. So when he was traveling to Mecca, where did he give the Juma at? Where, where was it? Where did he get the Juma? So some of the ulama said these are two separate hadith. Some of them said that they are two same hadith. Ibn al-Qayyim in the book Zad al-Ma'ad, he mentioned that they're the same hadith because the Prophet wasallam did not wear black imama during the Juma'at. The time of giving the Juma'at, he didn't wear the Juma'at. But it's an issue of ikhtilaf concerning how you understand the particular hadith. Analyze a'la and a'lam. That's a good point, Akhi. Any more questions, Akhwan? Okay, then, inshallah, we ta'ala, we naktafi bihad al qadr, but I wanted to share something with you, brothers. And that was this thing that you hear about what's going on. I'm going to tell you what happened very quickly and very briefly because many of the brothers wanted to know what had happened. One of the characteristics of the people of Al Islam, generally speaking, is that we have to try to, our best to be truthful. If a person is lying to get his point across, then although he may be lying and other people may not know he's lying, he should know that the haq is not with him. So he knows that something happened between him and a few people and he knows that he's lying and exaggerating. The other people may not know, but he has to be sincere and he has to know the haq is not with you or you wouldn't be lying, you wouldn't be exaggerating. And this is one of the problems with al-hawa. When I went to give the khutbah on Friday, in Manchester, the city of Manchester, I was invited to give the khutbah at a masjid called Masjid al Sunnah that I've been to a long time ago. I used to go to that masjid, but I hadn't been there for years. So when we went, we wound up leaving Birmingham late, 11.30, when we were supposed to leave 11 o'clock. So anytime I'm going to be late for a khutbah especially, I become muta nervous. Muta nervous. It's an Arabic word, muta nervous. And that's just how it is. I start to speak fast if I get on the minbar and things because it's just a psychological thing. So when we arrived in Manchester, it was at 1.30 when we were close to the masjid and the people kept calling me, where you at, where you at, where you at? So the sat nav sent us up this street and it was telling us we have to make a left at that street and that is the street where we're going to go. But we came by a masjid that was on this street and we saw people walking into this masjid. And the area looked familiar to me. This, I said, this looks like it's around here. The brother said, yeah, yeah. The sat nav is saying, this is it. It's on this street, the front. So it was a side door here, side door. So he said, okay, you guys, me and two other brothers, get out. And I parked the car. So because I was late, I jumped out of the car. I ran into the side door. And the bathroom was right there. I went into the bathroom. There was a line of people. I said, I'm supposed to give the khutbah today. Can I go? Can I go? They all allowed me to go. I had on my long johns and my turtleneck, and it was hot, 
and I was pressed. So I had to go to the bathroom. I had to take off my clothes. I was late. I did all of that. I went out. When I went into the member, into the musalla, I said, this is, uh, this is strange. I, I don't know this place. But I thought maybe they moved because the sat nav said, this is where we're at. And I, it was a perfect storm. So I got on the member and I started fiddling with the fan to make the fan work. Some old brother was sitting in the first seat and a chair said, oh, you have to do this, you have to do that. I did that. I took the microphone and I got ready to say, salamu alaikum. A brother came and he said, no, this is not the microphone. So he took the microphone. I thought he was the mu'adhan, he's going to give me another mic. But he was looking upset. But I've seen other mu'adhans look upset in other messages. Mu'adhans that had some issues. I thought that was a case. So I said, what are you upset for between him and me? He looked at me and he said, I'm not upset. But he was still looking upset. Then another brother came and he came not in a nice way. And he said, what are you doing? So I thought maybe these brothers are from the general people who don't know I'm supposed to give the khutbah, I'm scheduled. So to get up and say, that's okay, but not that way. And then I realized, oh man, I must be in the wrong masjid because I don't know this place. So I said to the people, is this not masjid of sunnah? And some of the regular people there who didn't have beers, they were smiling, I could see them in the audience. They said, no, 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 this is not masjid of sunnah. So it was a strange, funny situation. Wallahi, I didn't know where I was at, so quite naturally, I apologized to the whole jama'at, to these Muslims. I didn't know who they were. As a matter of fact, the brother who drove me there, Abu Abdullah Shaybani, he came in and he saw the commotion, and he's many times out of the frame. He's not always in the frame. He was saying, is this Brawi Masjid, this Brawi Masjid? Because he didn't know what was going on. It wasn't Brawi Masjid, so I said, I'm sorry to everybody. When I walked out of the door, when I left the door, Two of those brothers followed me. When I got to put my shoes on out in the corridor, one of them said to me, this is the masjid of the Salafis and the masjid of the Muqtadiyah. It's over there. Then I realized this is the masjid of the people who go overboard. The people were rough and tough. The people who, if you don't agree with them on issues, especially rulings of Sheikh Rabi and Madkhali, then they throw you outside of the Sunnah and off of the Sunnah. The Salafi of SP, the bid'ah that they're on, where they have ghulu and connecting the people with, it's me against the world. It's us against the world. We are against the world. The Martians are going to get us. The people always have to have this frame of mind. Us against the world. We are the Salafis. So I realized this was that masjid. So I said to the brother in Arabic, look, don't expose the regular people to this drama, the drama we have with each other, don't expose. And then one of them said, Ukhruj, ya walid, get out, boy. He said that to me. And then Shaitan got involved on my side, and I told him that you may know who I am, but uh, you don't know me. You don't want to deal with me in that jahili way. That's what I said. That's what I said. You may know who I am, but you don't know me. You don't want to deal with me in that jahiliya way. So I gave them, I gave them what they needed. When you say something like that, you always have to be just like the uh, non-Muslims, the, um, the, these people who take your words out of context, they get anything. They're not gonna say they're the first one who takes from the dictionary of bad words, mubtadiya, what it, get out, so forth, so on. And even if you think someone is a mubtadiya, then what you should do is never tell someone to get out of the masjid and then to take the statements of the salaf to prove to, you could tell people get out of the masjid. This is, is insanity. It's insanity. It's insanity. So what happened was I wound up leaving and I knew it wouldn't be a lot of time before they started going on the internet, the keyboard warriors that they are, that they are always trying to narrate these things to keep them in the minds of the sheep that follow them. They're at Diba, those Masakin brothers and sisters who want to be on the Sunnah, but they're blinded in thinking that that's the only way. So I was really amazed at how it turned out. And I didn't read the article that they wrote, but many people were telling me what was in the article. And I don't know how they mentioned so many other people that don't have anything to do with I, what I did on that day. But they always have to mention a Sheikh Ahmed Najmi said that. 
and this one over, and they just bring names just out of the hat to keep repeating the same thing. As Sheikh Ahmed Najmi, rahmatullahi alayhi, is my Sheikh. I know him better than them. I know him longer than them. So they told him a long time ago, there is a person in America who supports Abu Hassan al-Ma'rabi. What should we do with him? The Sheikh said, deal with him the way you deal with Abu Hassan al-Ma'rabi, who's a mubtadir. I don't agree with the Sheikh, rahmatullahi alayhi, that Abu Hassan al-Ma'rabi is a mubtadir. I don't agree with that. But if anybody said I was a supporter of him, they're not going to bring any dalil. I'm a supporter of Ali Hassan al-Halabi. I support him. And I support what he's upon. His mistakes, we put that aside. I say that in public and I say that in private. Abu Hassan al-Ma'rabi has some things that have happened that I don't agree with. But to say he's mubtadi, I don't say that. I didn't see some of the ulama who I look at like a Sheikh Abdul Muhsin al abad in these affairs. And if you see that, then that's your business. So anyway, the point is, a Sheikh Ahmed Najmi said, yeah, do with him what you do with Abu Hassan and Ma'rabi. First of all, I don't support him. That's the first thing. Second of all, even if I supported him, even if I don't see him as Mubtadi, because you make him Mubtadi, I'm Mubtadi, that's a bid'ah principle that their Sheikh is upon and they are upon that stuff. I'm going to bring down whoever doesn't bring that. The sheikh who says that, that's a bid'ah and I'm against that. I'm bereaved from that. It's not from our religion. Ali Hassan al, 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 Ali Hassan al, Ali Hassan al Halabi, a sheikh Rabi says that he's a mubtadi. A sheikh Abdul Muhsin doesn't say that he's a mubtadi. So if he supports Ali Hassan al do you do with him what you do with Ali Hassan al Ma'rab, Ali Hassan al Halabi? Do you do the same thing? So, Ikhwani, this stuff. Uh, we thought that it was a waste of time, but because a lot of the students wanted to know what was going on. I have some kid on my Facebook that I don't even deal with. I have people and ministers, the administrators from my Facebook. I don't deal with that Facebook that much. I send them some things, but not everything. Young brother, Sheikh, I heard something happen in Manchester. Can you tell me what happened? From a person's good Islam, leave alone what doesn't concern you. What, what are you talking about? He wrote a second time, Sheikh, what happened? In, in Manchester, this is my second time asking you. Then he wrote the third time. Sheikh, if you don't answer this time, then I'm just going to believe in what they said. Who does that except young people? So the administrator had to write and say, listen, this is, not, this is Abu Sama's Facebook page, but he doesn't deal with this Facebook like that. He oversees it, but he's not on the Facebook and in the Facebook. And who are you to say, if you don't answer, then I'm going to make this ruling and that ruling. So I'm only mentioning this, ikhwani, not for ida'at al-waqt, wasting your time, making you preoccupied with kalam fariq, but because many of the brothers want to know what had happened. And I invoke the curse of Allah upon myself and my children, because it's the dire Jews if I'm lying. And one of the good things that happened was, I had, good, I had some brothers with me. Brother from Cameroon, who's from Luton, and a brother from, uh, from uh, what's that place, uh, Limington Spa, Limington, and the drive Abu Abdullah. And because Master the Sunnah, they give the khutbah in Arabic all the time, they force some of the English-speaking people to go to that masjid, just as this masjid, Green Lane, used to force people to go to SP. When the khutbah used to be in Urdu, People say, I'm not listening to that. They will leave this place and go to SP. Some of those people were trapped and they became SP. I used to at that time tell them, go where you get benefit. Now I say, don't go to that masjid because you may get caught up into that drama. But anyway, some of those regular people who were not from there, who were from Masjid the Sunnah who were there, they witnessed what happened. But those people, they know that we don't have time to become keyboard warriors to be dealing with this stuff. This is how they stay validated. The cult. Jim Jones and those people. It's us against the world. It's us against the world. The Martians are going to get us. The other people, the pe people of Bid'ah, is going to get us, going to get us. Hey, teach the people the religion. And the guy who gave the, who actually wrote that stuff, who actually like, wrote that stuff. I mean, I don't want to make it personal or anything like that, but I don't know, Ikhwani. Nobody threw anybody out of the masjid, and I'm not a gangster or anything like that, but I don't know what is the need of that type of language. Nobody threw anybody out of the mischief. We walked out of the mischief when we were ready to walk out. May Allah accept it from us and from you, Ikhwani. That's what happened. 
هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله